Hello everyone, this is G and I'm back with another video. So I'm going to be further discussing uh, the, Mortal, the Mortal Kombat 11 Aftermath trailer. Now that a little more information's come out, and now that some bios are coming out, I've picked out a few that I want to discuss. I won't be covering everything, just a few things that are, are important from my perspective. So, as always, I hope you're all doing well. Uh, to any new subscribers, welcome. I hope that you continue to enjoy the content. And to everyone who's been here uh, for a while now, for the long haul, I hope you too continue to enjoy the content. So, let's get started. So, there's this PlayStation blog. I actually found this via a video I was watching about the character bios for Fujin and Shiva and a few others. And I'm going to go into that a little bit deeper. But there's this PlayStation blog written by Dominic Cianciolo. Or Cianciolo. My Italian is awful. I haven't tried to speak it since high school. But anyway, he's the story and voiceover director for NetherRealm Studios. So that awful Sindel retcon, he's at least partially responsible for it. Anyhow, he has revealed through this blog, which I will link to in the description in its totality. I'm not covering the whole blog here. But he has revealed a few things about the storyline and about the characters. So, let's get to it. It says here, Greetings, fellow fighters. Since the introduction of story mode to Mortal Kombat, you mean since the very first game in 1992? With the character bios and endings, it's always had a story mode. But anyway, that's me digressing back to the point. Since the introduction of story mode to Mortal Kombat, fans have made one thing clear. They're always eager for more. They're passionate about every character and want each to have their turn in the spotlight. That's why we at NetherRealm are so excited about Mortal Kombat 11 Aftermath. It will fulfill one of our fans' biggest requests. A continuation of the Mortal Kombat 11 story that features our great roster of characters. Yeah, this is just them feeding their own egos. But anyhow, the new chapters in time-twisting narrative in Mortal Kombat 11 Aftermath because that's what we needed more time travel. Allowed us to give Nightwolf, Night Wolf, Fujin, and Shiva their most sizable roles in any Mortal Kombat game to date. We get to learn more about what drives them, from Fujin's devotion to Earthrealm's mortals, to Shiva's undying loyalty to her Empress Sindel. The story also allows us to see these incredible fighters in action. Our cinematics team has dreamed up, I think you mean dreamt up, but okay, a whole new host of pulse-pounding action sequences which utilize each character's signature abilities. And then there's another part which says, Mortal Kombat 11 Aftermath picks up right where Mortal Kombat 11 ends. Liu Kang has finished Kronika. He and Raiden are at the dawn of time where they prepare to use Kronika's hourglass to restart history. But those preparations are halted when some, expected, some unexpected guests arrive, Fujin, Nightwolf, and Shang Tsung. Shang Tsung explains that they were Kronika's prisoners. Sure, that made sense. Released only upon her death, and they've come to stop Liu Kang from making a deadly mistake. During Liu Kang's final battle with Kronika, he destroyed her crown. If he tries to restart history without it, both the hourglass and reality will be destroyed. All realms will be lost. I'm guessing they're using this to explain Fujin being alive. Apparently now he's just a prisoner. I'm guessing that Frost and Cetrion, two certified killers, right? one of them being an elder god, just decided to imprison Fujin instead, instead of kill him. But anyway, it says, Liu Kang's only solution? Send Shang Tsung, Nightwolf, and Fujin back into the past to retrieve the crown before Kronika could even possess it. 
Wouldn't the crown be on her head? It's a crown. <laughs> Why would she be leaving it around Shang Tsung's island? <sighs> anyway. It's a plan that's so crazy, it just might work. If Liu Kang can keep Shang Tsung from double-crossing him. Okay, so that gives us a little information about some of the characters and the general plot of this story, right? So here's the first thing I wanted to address given this information. Kitana's absence. Kitana's absence. Now, according to a cutscene, and I talked about the cutscene in the previous video, where Aaron Black interrupts Shiva and Shao Kahn and everyone else from going uh, to the Soul Chamber. He specifically mentions that Kitana is Khan. He says, Kitana Khan. So as some, as, as some have been hypothesizing online in comment sections of other videos, this is not Mortal Kombat 2 era Kitana who doesn't know what's going on yet with her mother and and Shao Kahn and all that. She's the Khan. So why in the world, why in the world is she not involved with the restarting of history? You really want me to believe, Netherrealm. What you're saying is that you are so progressive that you decided to leave the restarting of all of history for all the realms. All right, it says here, right? Lu finished Chronica. He and Raiden are at the dawn of time where they prepare to use Chronica's hourglass to restart history before they get interrupted. So, you guys are okay with leaving Liu Kang and Raiden. Liu Kang and Raiden. Bruce Lee and the Blunder God to restart history. Not Liu and his better half. Not the Adam and Eve of the Mortal Kombat universe. No, no, no. Not them. Let's not have a male and female working together, together, I should say, to restart history, right? Let's not have a male and a female perspective. No, 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 no. Let's leave it to these two men, to the blunder god. Remember, Raiden killed Lu. He killed Lu by accident in Mortal Kombat 9. But let's leave it to these two guys. Let's not include a woman when literally you're restarting history for Earth Realm, Adenia, which is Katana's home realm, Chaos Realm, Outworld, uh, Order Realm, all these other realms. Uh, hell, the Nether Realm itself, right? Hell. All these different realms. And we're going to leave it to these two guys to restart history. Thank you, NetherRealm. Thank you for being so progressive. And I know some are saying, well, if it's just Lou and Raiden, that means that Chronica won a match. To which I say, and what? In the end, Chronica's dead. Chronica is dead. Kitana didn't die, to my knowledge. There, there is nothing in this stating that she died in battle. That would be a huge thing that you would want to mention. Right? Nothing to indicate that she died in battle. They're literally at the end and beginning of history. They can wait until she gets there. And then Raiden can give them some basic instructions. And they can go and start, you know, restart time or whatever it is. So Netherrealm, Netherrealm is so progressive that they're going to allow two men to restart their, their continuity, their timeline. Without a woman's opinion, without a woman's say or input or influence or anything, it's just going to be these two guys. So progressive, Netherrealm. So progressive. But moving on, we now get some of the bios, right? We have Fujin's bio here. Apparently, his theme, I guess, is security. And it says here, the god of wind, Fujin serves the elder gods alongside his brother Raiden as protectors of Earthrealm. Affable and lighthearted, he's adept at inspiring people's innate capacity 
for goodness and heroism to conquer forces of hatred and tyranny. Fuchin believes Earthrealm's best days are still to come, and he fights to ensure that bright future. Okay, so where the hell has he been all this time? But, real talk, right? Some people have been wondering what is exactly meant in this bio where, where it says that Raiden and Fujin are brothers. Some are saying it's brothers in the religious sense, or in the spiritual sense. Some are saying it's brothers as in brothers in arms or, or fellow elemental gods. Others are saying it's brothers as in relatives. Uh, blood relation, right? Here's the thing. Those people at the end, the last one saying that they're supposed to be related, eh, they're probably right, I would say. Because I wouldn't put anything past Netherrealm at this point. Honestly, if they're right, if Rain and Fujin are blood brothers, this would explain why Fujin bears such a striking resemblance to, to James Remar, who played Raiden in the Mortal Kombat Annihilation movie that came out in 1997. I should also point out that that movie also had Raiden, or rather I say gave Raiden a brother. The brother in that film was, I think it was uh, Shinnok? I think it was. I should also point out that film flopped badly and is hated by nearly everyone in the uh, fandom. But it did give us some great moments like Sindel's classic, or rather the, it's uh, Katana and Sindel. It's, mother, you're alive. And Sindel, too bad you will die. So it gave us classic lines like that, but it wasn't really a good film. So if it were me personally, I would not be trying to bring back in a element that really didn't work 20 plus years ago. Why do it now? Why does Raiden need a brother? Why do Fujin and Raiden suddenly need to be related to each other? If that's the case. Plus, let's be honest. Christopher Lambert, or Christopher Lambert, however you say it, will always be movie Raiden. Moving on. We now get Shiva. Yay. I'm so happy. And it says here, Equality. Yes, I know the song, Power of Equality. I like it as much as any other Red Hot Chili Peppers fan, but damn it, we don't need it here. But anyway, it says here, because of course it does, the male Shokan scoffed when Shiva, Shiva entered their contest to choose the Shokan's next leader. But Shiva proved herself more than their equal. After a resounding victory, she was crowned the first queen of the Shokan. Didn't King Gorbak have a queen, Queen Mai or something? That's what I'm hearing, but anyway. As queen, Shiva now leads her people in the fight to attain their rightful place as partners in Earth, sorry, in uh, Outworld's rule. Oh, the issues I have with this. Number one. Number one. Let's compare this to, or rather, or rather let's see here. I'm, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Let's take a look at this for a second. It says here that we, we're going to learn more about what drives them, drives these characters, right? From Fujin's devotion... Right, which at least is mentioned in his bio that, that he believes in the goodness of humanity and that humanity's best days are, are ahead. Excuse me. And then it says here, to Shiva's, and I, and I want to highlight this, undying loyalty to her Empress Sindel. I want you to focus in on that. Let's go over this, this bio again. I'm going to read it again. The male Shokan scoffed when Shiva entered their contest to choose the Shokan's next leader. But Shiva proved herself more than their equal. After a resounding victory, she was crowned the first queen of the Shokan. 
As queen, Shiva now leads her people in the fight to attain their rightful place as partners in Outworld's rule. Where is that undying loyalty to her empress, Sindel? That is not mentioned once in this bio. No mention of Sindel, no mention of the empress, no mention of loyalty to her, no mention of Shao Kahn. Let's compare Shiva's bios to some bios she's had in, in earlier games. For example, her original bio in Mortal Kombat 3. Shiva. She was handpicked by Shao Kahn to serve as Sindel's personal protector. She becomes suspicious of Shao Kahn's loyalty toward her race of Shao Kahn when he places Motaro as the leader of his extermination squads. On the outworld, Motaro's race of Centaurians are the natural enemy of the Shao Kahn. If I had to compare the two, this one and this one, I would say this one, hands down, is the better bio. You know why? Because this bio ties Sindel in to the major players. It ties Sindel in to what's going on. It says here she was handpicked by Shao Kahn to serve as Sindel's protector. She's become suspicious of Shao Kahn because of his alliance with Motaro and the Centaurians. It ties her into the major events of Mortal Kombat 3, which is the resurrection of Sindel. That resurrection of Sindel on Earth is what allows Shao Kahn to circumvent the rules of Mortal Kombat and invade Earth. It, it causes a cosmic merger. It merges heaven and hell and it merges um, um, Earth and Outworld. And that's how Mortal Kombat 3 starts. Yes, I am that lore hound. For a reason. Right, but let's also look at Shiva's bio from MK9, right? Shiva is a member of the four-armed Shokan race. Her markings reveal that she is of the royal, let's focus on this, royal Draco lineage. Like all Shokan, she pledged her life to Shao Kahn, bringing honor to her race by serving him. During an attack by Adenian rebels on, on Shao Kahn's fortress, Shiva fiercely protected Queen Sindel and prevented her capture. She was subsequently appointed Sindel's personal bodyguard until the queen's mysterious death in Earthrealm. Shiva is now the master jailer of Shao Kahn's oppressive dungeon. This is her bio per MK9, which to my understanding was her first and last appearance in the reboot. Right, remember, MK11 is still supposed to be part of the reboot. That, that would mean that at least some of the events in MK9 and MK10, or MKX, whatever you want to call it, are canon. So even in this bio, which was written well over a decade later, the original one that I read was, was 1995. This one is what? 2011, so it's been well over a decade. And yet, here still, Shiva is tied in to the major players, right? To, to, to Shao Kahn and to Sindel. And on top of this, it is now mentioned that she's actually of royal lineage. So why in the world, explain to me, explain to me, why in the world a character who is now part of, of a royal lineage, who has proven herself in pretty much every game she's been featured, and it was three, a few of the end titles, I think it was what, um, Deadly Alliance, Deception, and then Armageddon, and then she was brought back in nine. In those titles, she was always treated with respect and earned her place in Shao Kahn's uh, service through merit as we see with her bio in, in MK9, right? Uh, she pledged her life to Shao Kahn to bring honor to her race. So, so she's always been driven by wanting to, to bring her race honor and to have them respected by Khan and respected by Outworld. And then it says here that uh, during an attack by Adenian rebels on the fortress, Shiva protected Sin Sindel and prevented her from being captured. 
because of this. It says that she was subsequently appointed Sindel's bodyguard. So because she protected the queen of Outworld and Adenia, she was appointed officially as her bodyguard. And now, and after that, after, after Sindel died, Shiva was, was, was now the master jailer. So we see that Shao Kahn clearly has a certain amount of respect for the, for the Shokan and for merit. For merit. She earned her place in his service through merit. She did a good job, so he gave her an, another task. Why does the character, who's always been defined by her pride in being a Shokan, and as as was was uh, added in Mortal Kombat Nine, is part of a royal lineage. Why does she, of all characters, need an oppression narrative? Why does she need a "I'm overcoming oppression" narrative? It makes no sense to me. You know who actually could use that narrative though of overcoming a uh, class or a or a um, Systemic uh, oppression of sorts. Kintaro. Let's read his bio as of Mortal Kombat 9. Like Goro and Shiva, Kintaro is of the four armed Shokan race. Unlike his uh, aristocratic comrades, however, he is of lower class Tigar lineage. As is customary when recruiting Shokan and Centaur into Shao Kahn's service, one of each race must face each other in bloody combat. Kentaro killed his opponent and, in an unprecedented act of bravado, roared for more Centaur blood. Centaurs leapt furiously into the ring to their demise. This savagery left Shao Kahn to appoint Kintaro as his personal bodyguard. So Kintaro, like other Shokan, proved himself to Shao Kahn, right? By showing that he could take on all comers and he could brutally and savagely defeat them. And because of that, Shao Kahn now appointed him as his personal bodyguard. So now in that act alone, he's just, he's just put himself above both Goro and Shiva, if you think about it, in the pecking order. Because Goro was a prince, right? But he was only serving Shang, Shang Tsung. Shiva is the personal bodyguard of the queen, but he gets to be the personal bodyguard of uh, the emperor himself. So tell me again why, why Shiva needs this oppression narrative. As some may say, well, Jean, that's everything you're mentioning is with Shao Kahn. She's dealing with members of her own race. Yes, but the Shao Kahn have never been depicted in Mortal Kombat lore as being sexist. I have never come across anything saying that Kintaro was a sexist or that King Gorbak was a sexist. Or that Kintaro was a sexist. Kintaro's an idiot. Right? He's often portrayed as a like over um, over aggressive cocky fool who won't listen. But nothing, at least nothing I've ever come across, and I and I played this series literally as I grew up in the nineteen nineties. And I haven't heard anything about and think about it, Goro and uh, Kintaro and Shiva, to my knowledge, were, were only featured mostly in Mortal Kombat 9. Maybe Goro appeared in 10. But again, didn't, didn't exactly play a major role. So, where again has there been any mention, any official lore mention of there being sexism or sexist practice in, in the Shokan? In in Shokan culture. This is new. This is forced to give a character that does not need an oppression narrative an oppression narrative. Now though, imagine though that this were Kintaro instead. I'm going to read Shiva's new bio again, but this time replacing Shiva with Kintaro. And you tell me what you think. Kintaro. 
The male Shokan scoffed when Kintaro entered their contest to choose the Shokan's next leader. But Kintaro proved himself more than their equal. After a resounding victory, he was crowned as king of the Shokan. As king, Kintaro now leads his people in the fight to attain their rightful place as partners in Outworld's rule. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I think that having Kintaro and bringing him back, because they can do that. I think he's supposed to be dead or whatever. Who cares? Everybody in this damn game has died at least once. You can easily bring him back. I think that this bio, defeating all comers, right, which is exactly what he did in 9, and if this were his bio he'd be doing here, defeating all comers, proving that he can fight his way literally to the top, would be the best narrative. This fits Kintaro much, much, much better, in my personal opinion, than this ever could Shiva. Shiva doesn't have anything to prove to other Chokan. She would be respected for the fact that she's one of the chosen few who A, is already part of a royal lineage, and B, has served both the Empress and the Emperor. The at least in my opinion, most Shokan would automatically respect her because of what she has accomplished and who she is already. She's, she's essentially a princess in, in their uh, uh, culture from the information I've been able to uh, gather. This narrative of having to literally fight your way to the top fits Kintaro much better. But there's one last thing I want to point out about this. Shiva has always been, always been about the pride of the Shokan. That has always been what has motivated her. Not her gender, her pride as a Shokan and wanting to bring her people honor and respect. This is her bio from Mortal, sorry, not her bio, her ending from MK3. She defeats Mo. Motaro in, in a rage brings down Khan. In freeing the earth, she also frees the outworld. She then returns home and works to restore the pride and respect of her race. The pride and respect of her race. That has been and that should always be what motivates Shiva. She should be loyal to Khan up until he ain't loyal to her, but Everything she does should always be about her race of Shokan, not her being a female Shokan and having to show up the men or, or, you know, show them that she's as tough as they are. They would already know this. But rather, in my opinion at least, rather her bio and her motivation should always be about bringing honor and pride and respect to her people, to her race. Because guess what? If she's able to do that, if she's able to bring pride and pride and respect and honor to her race, that will automatically bring pride and respect and honor to the women in the race, both from people on the outside and on the inside. That's just my take, personally. But anyway, that's the video. Please let me know what you think. I will see you all in the next one. Have a good day or night, wherever you are. See you around. Bye.